I don't know if we're going to make it through the whole of chapter 8. I've got quite a few pages of notes here, so we may end up just uh, going as far as we can this morning. Um, but before we dive actually into this chapter, again, I want to uh, talk a little bit about the previous chapter. Chapter 7 was about uh, God's covenant, God's covenant with man, and uh, we learned what that is. And of course, I, I drew up here the the different, you know, that umbrella, uh, and, I'll, and I'll do it again just so, so there's an idea, again, keep in mind, because there's a reason why this chapter falls, comes after uh, the, la the last one there. And so, of course, we have the, the covenant of redemption. This is the, the overarching covenant, the, the one that was planned from eternity past, the, the one that is um, the, 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 the work, the promise that God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit uh, covenanted with each other and, of course, uh, is, is culminating in the, the sending of Christ, the second person of the Trinity. Uh, that covenant of redemption was made known, uh, was manifested uh, to, to man first in the covenant of works. And again, this was uh, in, in the garden, in the Garden of Eden. So again, we talked about what that was where uh, God gave Adam and Eve uh, a covenant. You know, you shall not eat of this, blah, blah. We've talked about that. And so there's, that's, that's the covenant of works. And of course, they failed it. They, they broke it. They, they did not complete their, their end of the bargain. And so, of course, God had every right then as, you know, the covenant. We talked about what those covenants were. Um, as the initiator, as the author of this covenant, God had every right and was within his legal bounds to, to condemn and destroy the human race by, because they broke the, the covenant of works. Instead of doing that, God instituted the covenant of grace. And of course, this is the, the only way that, that human beings are able to fulfill the covenant of works. And the covenant of grace becomes administered throughout time, and, and we're going to talk a little bit more today, but it's revealed uh, through, through history, and of course we, we have that history, it's called the Bible. And in the Old Testament we see how uh, there's, there's different things here, I've got some notes, so you know, things like the, the uh, covenant with, with Noah, uh, here God promises uh, that he will never destroy the world by flood, so that's, that's part of that covenant there. Uh, of course, we have the, the covenant with uh, Abraham. There, God, God promises that he will preserve his people, that he will uh, deliver Abraham from uh, the land of the Chaldees and, and give him a promised land uh, and, uh, and, a, and a nation that's far greater than the sands of the sea or sands on the beach. Uh, then we have the Mosaic covenant. Uh, and of course, here, God provides the law. And God provides the, the covenant rituals. God prescribes what, uh, what the worship uh, of his holy name should look like. Uh, there's the Davidic covenant. And of course, this covenant is uh, that God will provide Israel's true king, uh, that God will provide the, the leader and the representative uh, for, uh, for his people. Then we have like the, the prophetic covenants. Um, this is the, the covenant that God will preserve a righteous remnant. You know, this is... These are the folks who are in exile that God will, uh, will bring them through and will see them through and return them to, to Israel. And then, of course, we have the culmination of the covenant of grace, which is in the new covenant. And, of course, the new covenant is that God fulfills his promises in Christ. And so this is, a, 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 I guess, a continuation, a, chron a chronology, if you will, of, of going through history and going through time. And of course, we come here to the new covenant and we talk about, and we're going to talk a little about today about how the covenant redemption works, but it's by Christ who fulfills this because Christ in the new covenant completes the work. So the, and one of the things we talked about, the covenant of grace does not replace and does not supersede the covenant of works. Rather, what God is doing by his grace is why it's called the covenant of grace is that God is providing for us a way for the covenant works to be fulfilled. It can't be fulfilled because Adam broke it, so he can't do it. No human being can do it because we're, he's our federal head, and as, as our representative, he threw us all into the fall. And so the only way for the covenant of works to be fulfilled 
is for God, by grace, to provide for us the Redeemer, which, of course, culminates in the new covenant. As we can see, this is all part of the covenant of redemption. So that's, uh, again, just sort of a brief overview of what we talked about last, uh, last week. And, and again, so the new covenant, also known as the New Testament, is a reason why we call it the New Testament. Um, in there, it, the new covenant describes how the covenant of works, how the covenant of works is fulfilled and applied to fallen and sinful man. That's how the new, that's what the new Testament does. And then the, the way that happens is through the mediator, which is Christ Jesus, and of course the subject of this chapter. Do you have a question? So it's not, so they're not replacing things. So what we're doing here is God, and, and the answer is yes, because if you look at the time, you know, between Noah and Abraham is hundreds of years, between Abraham and Noah, Noah Moses is like another 400 years, you know, and so yeah, the, the people kept forgetting their covenant with God. And God, out of his grace, which is why this falls under the covenant of grace, they're like renewals, yep, and, and then again, it, it culminates ultimately in the new covenant, so yeah, that's, but, but they don't replace it, they are renewals, if you will, and again, the whole point is so that the covenant of grace, or the whole point of the covenant of grace is to fulfill the covenant of works, which we can't do, it's going to take our mediator to do it for us, yeah, that's a good question. Any other questions on sort of this overview here? All right, so we're going to dive into the second or the eighth chapter here. I think I need to wipe my, uh, my little eraser. All right. Okay, I'll read this first article to us. It pleased God in his eternal purpose to choose and ordain the Lord Jesus. So again, I'm just going to stop briefly there, talking about the covenant of redemption, the plan from eternity past. So that's what we're talking about there. It pleased God in his eternal purpose to choose and ordain the Lord Jesus, his only begotten son, to be the mediator between God and man, the prophet, priest, and king, the head and savior of his church, the heir of all things, and judge of the world, unto whom he did from all eternity give a people to be his seed and to be by him in time redeemed, called, justified, sanctified, and glorified. So it's important to note that the, the work of redemption comes from the good pleasure of God himself. Uh, it pleased God to provide for us this mediator. Um, and indeed, nothing pleases God more than obedience which is what this mediator does, which is what the mediator fulfills, because every human being does not obey God. But obedience is what pleases God. And so we have to have this mediator in order to, to bring us into reconciliation with God. And of course, when would we hire a mediator? When do we need a, re a mediator? And it's usually when uh, there's an estrangement between two peoples or two parties. There's some sort of, of disagreement going on. Um, courts may uh, appoint a, a mediator who will try to bring sides uh, together to, to form some sort of agreement. Uh, many workplaces uh, with their HR departments would hire a mediator who will, will bring together reconciliation uh, between factions and things of those like. So this is, that's when we would use a mediator, and of course this mediation is also necessary within our religious uh, relationship. All of Scripture makes abundantly clear that we are by nature at enmity with God. By our nature, we are not friends with God. By our nature, we are enemies of God. Um, too often, many assume that God is not estranged from us, that he actually just hates sin but loves the sinner. We, we hear that. We, we, we speak that way. But this is a tell that people will not admit 
that their hearts are filled with hostility toward their creator. Uh, the atheist or the agnostic might say, I don't hate God, I just don't believe in him. But by nature, men do not love God's holiness. They do not love God's omnipotence or his omniscience or his immutability, just to name a few, because these attributes make God an obstacle to autonomy. That's the, that's the reason why human beings are by nature uh, at, at, at odds with God, or enemies of God, because we want to be God. We want to make the decisions. We want to be in control. We don't like the idea of an all-powerful, sovereign God who knows everything and guides everything and directs everything and does everything, because then we have no power. But yet that's exactly the Bible, the, the, the God that's described in the Bible. To not believe in God, as the atheist or the agnostic might say, to not believe in God is to claim authority over him. Oh, I don't believe in him, so I get to live the life that I want. That's the logical progression when you ask the atheist why he doesn't believe. Because he wants to have control over his own life, over his own destiny. And of course, that in turn puts a person at odds with God's attributes and therefore is an enemy of God. And so this is why we need a mediator. This is why human beings have, have needed someone to come in and, and uh, mend the relationship between us and God. Now, some wrongly assume that this mediator overcame God's hostility. And that somehow now uh, God's no longer mad and that man is no longer bad. But chapter 8 distinctly denies that very line of argument. God was pleased from all eternity to provide for us a mediator. Dr. Sproul in his book, Truths We Confess, which I've been using for this study, he says, it was the Father himself who took the initiative in this work of reconciliation. That's the other thing we have to keep in mind. It's God is the one who initiates this. We, human beings, of course, would never come up to God and say, hey, God, give us a mediator because we want to be in a good relationship with you. Remember, we're at odds by nature. We're at odds with God. We, we don't want to do that. And so God comes in and does the initiative work. He provides for us the, the, the reconciliation. Now, the one who, who was the most violated in this relationship. Think about that. God is the one who is violated in this relationship. Man is the one who broke the covenant, not God. God never breaks the covenant. But century after century, decade after decade, man turns his back on God. God is the true violated party here. And he, he is the one is coming down, condescending, and providing for us the mediation. That right there, if we just stop and meditate on that, that right there should fill us with a love for his grace and his mercy. That he would be willing to condescend to disobedient children and find a way to redeem us. And of course, this was made very clear in verses like John 3.16, for God so loved the world. This God did choose and ordain, or if you're reformed, he elected the Lord Jesus. Through election, God brings about his eternal plan of redemption. And we talked about elections. The reason why election was back in chapter 3, God's eternal decrees. We have to talk about that and get that right before we can understand everything else, especially in, or including God, Jesus' mediatorial role. Romans chapter 8, verse 29. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined. So Paul's talking about the believer. Uh, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. Jesus was the first elect. He was the first elected person. And in, in him, we have our 
election. Through him, we have our uh, membership in the household of heaven. Dr. Sproul says believers are chosen in Christ to participate in the benefits that the Father bestows on the Son. Now, the Westminster Confession outlines the mediatorial role of Christ. It starts by naming his three offices, prophet, priest, and king. These, in the Old Testament, in the Old Covenant, were three separate offices. So no one could uh, intermix. No one could be a priest and a prophet and a king at the same time in the Old Testament. And of course, when you go through and you read, you see that prophets were God's spokesmen. They were uh, telling people, proclaiming to people God's word and God's will. The priests were God's intercessors. Uh, they were the ones who provided the sacrifice on behalf of the people, who, who lifted up the prayers to God and represented the, 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 the religious and the sanctity of the nation to God. And of course, the kings were God's representatives. Uh, he was the, the one whom God put as head of the church, if you will. And in him, uh, the, the leadership was modeled what true uh, godly leadership was supposed to look like, what God had ordained. And whatever the king did reflected on the nation. When we went through and talked about our series through, through um, the histories, we saw how when there was a, a good king, a, a righteous king, the nation reflected that righteousness. And when there was a wicked king, the nation reflected that wickedness. And so we see how the king acts as a representative or a federal head, if you will, of the nation for God. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, 2 verse 5, uh, there Paul says, For there is one God and one mediator also between God and men, the, the man Christ Jesus. So those offices, while important and fulfilled as they were in the Old Testament, were but promises and shadows that were pointing to the one true mediator, which is Jesus Christ. And of course, only one mediator could fulfill ultimately all three of those offices. If you go back and just think about the different ones, prophet, priest, and kings, if you go through and read through Israel's history, you'll see how even in those offices, people were corrupt, how kings were wrong, how prophets were liars, and how priests were unholy. Because we're humans, and humans make mistakes, and humans are sinful. And so even in the Old Testament, those shadows were never fully realized until Christ Jesus. And so only one mediator has the ability to bring about the, the goal of mediation, which is redemption and reconciliation. And we'll talk about what the prophet, priests, and kings, what their role was a little later. But no one but Christ has the necessary qualifications to affect this reconciliation. It was only Christ alone who, who had the ability to bring about this reconciliation. Because Christ not only proclaimed the word, but he alone is the word. John chapter 1 tells us that, reminds us of that. Everyone else, prophet, priests, and king in the Old Testament, they proclaimed God's word, but none of them was God's word. None of them was able to fulfill perfectly until the word, the divine logos, was incarnate in man. And so Jesus not only speaks God's word, but reveals God's word in his own person. And so the Old Testament prophets, the Old Testament priests and kings, they acted beyond themselves in those roles. So they were pointing people to the Messiah. They were pointing people to the mediator. And so Christ not only acted in those roles, but he is those roles. He is that role perfectly and completely. He is the perfect priest. He is the complete prophet. And he is the true and ultimate king. And so this mediator then is rightly known as the head, of the, or head and savior of his church, as the confession says. In the New Testament, the church is described as a body, and we've talked about that, and we love that, love that image. It's perfect. 
Jesus isn't just the church's founder, which is what sometimes the head means. He is that, but he's more. He's the head in the sense that he rules over the body. This is why Paul uses that language to, to describe how the head moves about the rest of the body. What the mind thinks, what the mind wants, the body does. And of course, we, ha- we know that. What our heads, uh, what our minds, what our brains do, they control everything in the body. And so Jesus does likewise. He's not just the founder. He is the head. He is controlling the body. He is controlling his earthly temple. And so Jesus, as the head of the church, means that he has all authority over us. He has all authority to rule over us. As the head, and we as the body parts, we have to submit. My hand can't say to my brain, I'm not going to do whatever you want me to do. That's, that doesn't work that way. Our, our individual members don't rebel against our brain, right? That's the way the church should run. That's the way the invisible church does run. The true body of Christ. Whatever he wills, whatever he designs, the body does. The body reflects. And so we are to live in submission to him. If we truly believe and and claim that we are members of this body, then we must submit to him. The church's mission, the church's identity, the church's agenda, all these things are to be determined by him. And you ask, how are they determined? Right here. The answer is in this book. What Jesus wants the church to look like, what Jesus wants the church to do. And because Jesus is the head of the church, the church is redeemed, called, justified, sanctified, and glorified. This is the golden chain of salvation and belongs to the church because it comes through Christ, her head. And we'll talk more about the golden chain a little later. So I'm going to end this article. Any questions? All right. Seeing none, we'll move on to the second article. The Son of God, the second person in the Trinity, being very and eternal God of one substance and equal with the Father, did, when the fullness of time was come, take upon him man's nature, with all the essential properties and common infirmities thereof, yet without sin. That's the key phrase there being conceived by the power of the Holy Ghost in the womb of the Virgin Mary and of her substance. So the two whole perfect and distinct natures, the Godhead and the manhood, were inseparably joined together in one person without conversion, composition, or confusion. Which person is is very God and very man, yet one Christ, the only mediator between God and man. Article 2 here essentially affirms the historic doctrines, the historic creeds of Jesus as the second person of the Trinity. What the historic church has always affirmed, here Westminster confirms and affirms again. And so to understand sort of the the words, the language of this, we're going to have to do a a, a history lesson. We're going to have to jump back in time to the year AD 325 to the Council of Nicaea. There... The church debated over two words. I'm going to draw them up here because literally the difference in these two words is one letter. So that's, that's, that's why we're going to, I'm going to write here. So there was a debate over the word, and uh, make sure I spell it right, so I'm going to grab this. So there's a debate over this word, homoousios, that's the Greek word, and I'll explain what it means in a minute. And this other word, homoousios, this I, is the the big difference there. So this was the debate of the century in the year 325. This is is what what shook the church in the 4th century. Um, And so we see that, we, we hear, if you've heard about the Council of Nicaea, you've probably heard of Arius, or Arianism, or Arius and Arians, um, Arianism. 
Uh, Arius was, a, was a, I guess, a leader of the church in Alexandria. Now, Dr. Sproul uh, gives him the benefit of the doubt. Arius wanted to prevent any undermining of pure monotheism. Okay, so, so did, we're, we're trying to give him the benefit of the doubt. You know, he's, he's considered a heretic within historic uh, Christianity, but we want to give him the benefit of the doubt. He, he wanted to preserve a pure monotheism. And so he feared that referring to Christ as God would undercut pure monotheism. That was Arius's concern, a noble concern. And so he argued, in order to defend that position, he argued that Christ is a creature, that he had a beginning and was like the Father. So this is where that word, that I, comes in. Like God. That's, what, that's the difference here. And of course, this is that he is God, or one essence or substance with the Father. He is like God. So that's what Arius wanted to preserve monotheism. He wanted to protect God. And in order to do that, he had to describe Jesus as a creature. But not just a normal creature. I mean, he was, you know, he was special. He was like God. Now, the adopted principal at Nicaea rejected Arius' teaching, considered him a, a heretic, and asserted that the Son is of the same substance, homo oisios, same, you know, like homogenous, and oisios, which I'm not sure if we use that word in English, so that's the word substance, of the same substance with the Father. That's what the Council of Nicaea decreed, that the three persons of the Trinity are one God. They're not three distinct gods, they're one God. And God is one in substance, which we talked about that when we talked about the Trinity back in chapter 2. God is one in substance, but three in subsistence. The three persons, three persons in one essence. And so the church would later distinguish that the Son of God is eternally begotten of the Father, that he is consubstantial with the Father. That was affirmed in Constantinople in the year 381. And if you ever read or proclaim the Nicene Creed, this is what the historic church confesses. This is what the Nicene Creed all three major religious groups of Christianity support it. Protestants, Catholics, Orthodox support the Nicene Constantinople Creed. And so the Westminster Confession affirms this. So this, you know, the Westminster Confession is not new in the sense that it's coming out of nowhere and introducing some sort of newfangled ideology. No, the Westminster Confession is taking the historic creeds and understanding it and showing how they apply even today, or at least how they applied in 1643. And so they affirm the historic creeds that Christ is consubstantial. Of course, of the same essence, if you get that word consubstantial, con, same, substance, is of the same essence with the Father. And Christ is co-eternal with the Father. So there was never a time when the Son was not. Did you hear that? There was never a time... When the Son was not. So second person of the Trinity was never created. He, he, he always existed with the Father and the Holy Spirit. The Son did, as the confession says, when the fullness of time was come, take upon him man's nature. And so this sentence here confesses that redemption took place in ordinary history. Because the second person had to come into our time and space and take on man's nature. Of course, God is working out salvation in and through history. Redemptive history has a clear order to it in which God reveals salvation to his people. And that history is outlined, detailed in this book. Christianity is about real places, real people, and real events and a real future hope for God's people. Now, the Westminster Divines draw from Galatians chapter 4, verse 4, which says, 
When the fullness of time came, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born of the law. That's the, the scriptural reference. And so they're using, drawing that word fullness from Paul's letter. That Greek word actually carries with it much more than our English can provide. This is an, this is an, an uh, instance of where our language falls short of what the Greeks would have understood when they read this Greek word. Uh, Dr. Sproul shows that, that this word, uh, pleroma is the word, it suggests a glass. So if you imagine a glass, it's under a faucet, and there's water cascading from the faucet and overflowing over the sides of this glass. It's full to the point of overflowing. That's what that word means. In the fullness of time, in, in that history was overflowing with an anticipation at the birth of Jesus Christ, at the incarnation of God in human flesh. This is what the fullness of time is, that there is this, this anticipated overflow of God's grace. The confession next asserts, so that two whole, perfect, and distinct natures the Godhead and the manhood were inseparably joined together in one person without conversion, composition, or confusion. So this article, or this phrase of the article, um, has in mind another historic creed, has another historic confession. This time, the Chalcedonian definition, which was um, outlined at the Council of Chalcedon in the year 451. Uh, so here again, we have to jump back into history for a moment. Uh, the Chalcedonian definition from that time uh, is actually a, a, it's like a, a razor thin uh, line that if you're going to be a Chalcedonian Christian, which most Orthodox Christians are, if you move too far in one direction or another, you're going to fall into heresy. Either God's going to, or Jesus is either going to be too much deity and not enough humanity, or he's going to be too much humanity and not enough deity. So there's like a, it's a very thin tightrope that the Chalcedonian definition lays out for us, and we have to walk it. And so to understand this definition, let's jump back to the history books. So by the 5th century, two major heretics arose. I'm going to draw their names up here just so you can see them. So these are two folks who were considered uh, heretics by the, the church. There was uh, a guy named uh, U.T. Eutyches, and a guy named, no, it's an N, Nestorius. Have you ever heard any of those guys, Eutyches and Nestorius? So Eutyches taught what became known as the Monophysite. And I'm going to explain what that word is, the monophysite heresy. So this is what he, what he put. Essentially what this heresy, monophysite, says is that Christ is one nature. So there's not two natures in Christ, you know, divine and humanity. There's monophysite heresy says there is one nature. And of course, this is where we get mono, meaning one, and the, the physis, is, is nature, uh, is usually what that's defined as. So it says that Jesus has one nature uh, and that Jesus' nature was a mixture. It was a mixture of divine and human and humanity. So a mixture of deity and humanity. It wasn't, they weren't distinct. They were combined and mixed together into one nature. And essentially what it was, was it was a deified human nature, if you will, or, or, or a humanized uh, divine nature. Uh, you know, it's a very confusing thing. It didn't make sense. Uh, and, and of course, neither, neither was he completely divine nor completely human. He was this, this weird mixture. Literally, literally the, he was, it was a confusion. You know, and, and of course, you know, we, we use that word confusion in the sense that, oh, I'm confused. But, uh, but look at that. Khan coming together. Or, or a mix, and then the fuse, you know, confusion. So that's what, it was literally a confusion. It was, it was a mixture of two natures in one human being. And it just, it didn't make sense. And the church denied that, they claimed that's a, that's a heresy. Nestorius, on the other end, he separated Christ's divine 
nature, too much from his human nature. That, they, uh, that they're, they're distinct, that, that uh, these two personalities are existing in one body. That, that's, that if they're not mixed, but they're separate. And they're somehow mysteriously working together in here. Now, the interesting thing is Nestorius' theology is still held by some Christians today. Uh, the Syrian Orthodox Church considers, would, they wouldn't call themselves this, but their theology is, or at least their Christology, is Nestorian. Uh, he, he fled there after this event in Chalcedon. Um, but So in response to these two heresies, the church declared that Christ is one person, so not two persons, one person, and he has two natures. So not one nature that's mixed all together. So, this, so they're, 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 they're essentially saying both these guys are wrong, and this is how, because Jesus is not two persons but one person, and Jesus is not one nature but two natures. And it's held together in Christ. And that, uni that, uh, that union was, of course, affirmed by Chalcedon with this phrase. If you ever read the Chalcedonian definition, it says that Jesus was truly man and truly God. The two natures are perfectly united in one person. And so to affirm this, so this is, this is the, the interesting thing. To affirm this, the, the Council of Chalcedon used a method known as the via negativa. If you know Latin, you know what that word is, via negativa? It's it, it, what it means is the, the way of negation. So trying to wrap our heads around how Jesus is one person <clears throat> and two natures, that's hard, right? It's hard to try and say, how does that work? They struggled with it in 451. And so the way they came to understand what Jesus is is through the via negativa, through the, through the way of negation, essentially by describing what something is not in order to describe what it is. And so what they came with was four negatives about that, about Jesus, about his Christology. First is he's without mixture. So it's not mixed. It's not a, they're, they're not, you know, somehow 50% this and, and, or, or some percentage of that. There's, there's not a mixture. He is without confusion. So again, it's similar to mixture. There's not, there's not confused. You can't, you can't um, blend them together. They're distinct. You can tell the difference between divine and human. So they're not confused, they're without confusion. And they're without division, so that the first two were against Eutyches. He's without division, so they're united. They're not separate. These two natures exist in one person because Jesus is one human being. We know that. He wasn't two people, he's one. So there's no division there, and there's no separation. They aren't separated. From one another. That God is really in Christ, in Christ incarnate. So that one example is that, uh, sort of talking about that, is there was a heresy out there that says Jesus wasn't actually a real person, rather he was like a hologram, they wouldn't have used that word, but you know, God never actually came down to earth, he sort of just created this visible hologram of Jesus. No. There was no separation there. God was actually in Christ Jesus. And so that's how the Chalcedonian definition works and how it, again, because it's, it's hard to wrap our heads around it in a positive sense, but we can understand it a little bit by the negative sense, by saying all right, what, what it's not. Okay, so if you didn't know what a chair was, you know, I don't, I don't have a chair here. You, well, look at that, that's a stool. Right? What's the difference between a stool and a chair? Well, a stool doesn't have a back. You know, if you didn't, if you didn't know what a stool or a chair was, and you wanted to describe what, it, what a, a stool was to someone who'd never seen one before, you'd tell them, oh, well, think of a chair, but take the back off of it. It's a chair without a back. So the via negativa. So that's what we're talking about there, is describing something by what it's not. And so this history lesson may seem just like it's, it's just that history. It doesn't, doesn't matter today. What, why are we even talking about it? 
But actually, attacks on the biblical doctrine of Christ are present even today. Some deny the, the deity of Christ, and they focus more on his humanity. Uh, they, they consider Jesus a great and insightful man, but nothing more. That he was, and there, there are people who profess to be Christians who think this way, who say, oh, Jesus, no, he's, he's not God. He's, he, was, he was used by God. Of course, there are non-Christians. Muslims think that same way. They don't claim Christ. They recognize Christ as a Messiah. Jesus, they wouldn't call him Christ. They'd say, Jesus is a prophet, but they would never say he is God. Uh, liberation theologians, if you ever study those folks from Latin America, they claim that Jesus was someone who came to empower the disenfranchised. That's not what the scripture says about Jesus. No, he is, he is God. God incarnate, not just some man God uses. Some deny the humanity of Christ in exchange for the deity. The Roman Catholic Church believes that the bread and the wine in the Lord's Supper are supernaturally transformed into the body and the blood of Christ while at the same time retaining their outward characteristics. They still taste like bread and wine, but they are somehow transformed into the body and the blood of Christ. Catholics still today teach that. Now, somehow, the body and the blood of Christ is present on the communion table, or I guess it's an altar in the Mass, on the altar, but not just on that altar, on every altar in every Catholic church around the world at the same time Sunday morning. Now, when we think about that, don't body and blood belong to Jesus' humanity? Right? They're, they're part of his physical nature. God doesn't have blood. God doesn't have a body. But a person does. And so if, if body and blood are part of, of Jesus' human nature, does human nature have omnipresence? Can I be in all places at once? Can you? I wish I could. No physical being can do that. And so the Roman Catholic Church denies the humanity of Christ in the Lord's Supper by locating his body everywhere at once. Now the Reformed do hold that there is a real presence, but that presence is through the divine nature and not the human nature. But you can see how even today, even though there's these historic definitions there is still confusion and there's still denial of the perfect mixture, the perfect combination, excuse me, of God's, of the two natures in one person. Any questions on that? All right, the next article is kind of short, so I should be able to finish it. Or at least my notes are short. Article three. The Lord Jesus, in his human nature, thus united to the divine, was sanctified and anointed with the Holy Spirit, above measure, having in him all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, in whom it pleased the Father that all fullness should dwell, to the end that, being home, holy, harmless, undefiled, and full of grace and truth, he might be thoroughly furnished to execute the office of a mediator and surety, which office he took not unto himself, but was thereunto called by his father who will put all power and judgment into his hand and gave him commandment to execute the same. So this paragraph, again, both maintains the perfect union of Jesus' two natures and distinguishes at the same time between Jesus' human and divine attributes. So let me repeat with that. So the confession is maintaining that the two natures his human and his divine, are um, per, in a perfect union in Jesus. But in order to understand the work of mediator, we do need to distinguish between the attributes, the way they work and how they participate in him. So that's what we're doing here in this, in this article. We're not separating the two natures, but we're talking about the, the attributes of the two natures in the one person. So for instance, sometimes Jesus would, was hungry. He was thirsty, he was weary, he wept, he slept. These are examples from scripture. These are attributes 
to his human nature. Because God doesn't have a stomach. God doesn't ever get weary. God doesn't do it. But we attribute those things to his human nature. Sometimes Jesus could sense people's thoughts. He predicted the future and he did miraculous things. These are attributes to his divine nature. And so one important aspect of his human nature is by taking the place of Adam, he was able to be our perfect mediator. So this is the reason why he has to be also human. He can't just be God. He has to be human. Because in his role as human, in the attribute of his humanity, he takes the place of Adam. Of course, Paul expands upon that on how he was the, uh, the, there was the first Adam and all sin and things like that. And Jesus, we can talk about that another time. But that's, that's the role, that's the attribute of his humanity here. And so the confession <clears throat> says that he was anointed with the Holy Spirit above or, or without measure. He was anointed by the Holy Spirit. Now, Dr. Sproul makes note that there is no essential difference. There's no essential difference between the divine nature of Christ, so the deity of Christ, and the Holy Spirit. So there's no essential difference there, because again, there are three persons of one essence. So we often speak of the second person of the Trinity being in the incarnated in Christ. But remember, the second person, the Son, is never separated from the first or the, or the last or the third. The, the, the word, the divine word, the second person of Trinity is also connected, related, united with the Father and the Spirit. And so what we confess here is distinguishing between the manner of operation. So what is it that the Holy Spirit is doing? And so in the New Testament, we do not read of Jesus performing any miracles before his baptism, Right? In fact, we, we rarely read anything other than his birth, few birth narratives. Nothing else happens in Jesus' earthly childhood. But there are some Gnostic texts which are out there which are not canon. You can read them if you want. They're interesting. But don't ever let them influence your understanding of Jesus. They claim these fantasies about Jesus that in his, in his youth, in his childhood, he, he turned mud pies into birds or that he would uh, punish uh, kids who, who picked on him. Uh, he would cast spells on them. That's, that this is you know, things that pop up in these, in these Gnostic texts. We don't see that in Scripture. We don't see, do you have a question? Is that why they have the word harmless there? <clears throat> no, that's something else. Harmless meaning innocent, which is why that's, that has to involve with his passion. He was undeserving of death. That's why he was harmless. That's what I mean by harmless. Uh, yeah, he was harm he harmless. He is harmless. Exactly, yeah. yeah. And so Reformed theology holds that at his baptism, Jesus was anointed with the Holy Spirit. Of course, we see that. That appears in all four Gospels, the baptism of, of Christ. And at that moment, he was empowered by the Holy Spirit in his human nature to fulfill the role of the Messiah. That's what, that's what Reformed theology confesses. Of course, Jesus himself supports this when he begins his public ministry by reading from Isaiah 61, verse 1. Well, that almost, if, if I remember, I didn't go through and read it in all of the Gospels, but when it pops up, Jesus always does that after his baptism. So he gets baptized, he gets sent into the wilderness. And then he returns, and he goes into the synagogue, and he asks for the scroll from Isaiah, and he reads from it, and he reads this from Isaiah 61, verse 1. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the afflicted. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to captives, and freedom to prisoners. And of course, Jesus says in that same passage when he's reading this in Luke 4, 21, he says, today this Scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Today, not before, not when he was born, not when he was casting spells on children. He never did that. Today, when he read that scripture, right after his baptism, today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. I mean, every Christian confesses this when we call on Jesus Christ, Christ. 
Of course, Christ is the Greek word for Messiah, which means anointed one. He was anointed by the Holy Spirit at a particular moment in history to carry out the functions of his office. Isaiah 61 further teaches us that the earthly ministry of the Messiah was to, carry, was to be carried out by a human person anointed by the Holy Spirit. This person, had, the Messiah has to be anointed by the Holy Spirit. Jesus couldn't just have appeared here as God. Okay, God couldn't have just said, poof, there's a man and he's going to fix it all. No, he has to be, he has to appear as a, he has to be as a man. He is a human being and he has to be anointed by the Holy Spirit. God required a human fulfillment of the law. Remember, when we go back up, I erased it now, the covenant of works was between God and human beings. Human beings messed up. Human beings broke it. Human beings are responsible. And so God, instead of punishing humans, provides the covenant of grace. And it is incumbent upon a human to fulfill it. And of course, that human is the mediator, Christ Jesus. So this is not possible. That fulfillment of the covenant of works is not possible if God keeps the law for us. Because only the God-man can and does keep the law for us. And so this article teaches us, Dr. Sproul says, that the office of Christ had to execute, the office that Christ had to execute was to satisfy the demands of the law. Jesus' role as the mediator was to demand, or was to satisfy the demands of the law. In order for us to be perfectly redeemed, in order for the covenant of works to be fulfilled on our end, the the law had to be satisfied by a perfect man. It couldn't be satisfied by God. It couldn't be satisfied by an angel. It had to be satisfied by a man because it was a man that was part of that covenant of works and it was man who broke it, who failed it. And so in order for us to be justified, we cannot be redeemed only by Christ's death. Christ's death is important. Indeed, there is no redemption without the death. But we cannot separate the death and the resurrection from his life. Because his life of perfect obedience is crucial. For he is the one man who fulfills the demands of the law for others. His holy and righteous life, not only his death, but his life, is the fulfillment, he was the only person who perfectly kept the covenant of works during his whole life. This was a man paying the price for men. Therefore, he is our substitute. We talk about substitutionary atonement. He offers himself on the cross instead of us. In that moment, on the cross, he bears the full weight of God's judgment in our stead as our substitute. And so the only difference between him and you and me, so the only difference that we have from Christ is that he alone is sinless. In every other respect, he was a human being like you and me. He had feelings he had to use the bathroom, he was hungry, he slept, he got tired. In every other respect, he was like you and me. But he was sinless. And that is important. Because only a sinless human could not only take the judgment of God and redeem the rest of the human race, the rest of God's people. And so the sinlessness of Jesus is actually almost more astonishing, when we think about it, more astonishing than his resurrection. Have you thought about that? The resurrection is pretty fantastic, but other people came back from the dead. Lazarus, the Shunanite woman's son, 
several children. People come back from the dead. But no one, no one has ever loved God with all his mind and heart and strength. None of us has ever loved our neighbor as much as we love ourselves. Dr. Sproul rightly comments, can you imagine someone loving every minute of his life, living, excuse, living his entire life, loving God with an undiluted, perfect affection, whose whole mind is devoted to the Father, who has no other desire than to obey the Father's will. That is far more astonishing. And indeed, harder for me, especially, maybe for you as well, it's hard for me to wrap my, heads around, my head around. I can wrap my head around a resurrection. I have a hard time wrapping my head around a person who loves God so completely and fully that he obeys him at every single moment of his life. Jesus' sinless life is part of the payment made to God to balance our account. His righteous living and his resurrection both justify us before God because both satisfy God. Any questions? All right. Well, seeing none, we're, we're at the hour, so I don't want to continue on. Uh, next week, we will not meet. I am going on a, on a, a retreat, Con Ed retreat, uh, so I'm going to be out of town. So we will not be here next week. We'll return the following week. Uh, so if you come, you can always just sit in here and pray for a minute, but I'm not going to be here uh, to, to study with you all. Uh, so again, we'll pick up with Article 4 in, in two weeks' time. Uh, let's close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, first of all, it, it is a humbling thing to remember that you sent Jesus to be our mediator. We talk about him as our Savior and as our Lord, but do we often think about his role in reconciling us with you? Lord, we are grateful for it. Indeed, Lord, we, we are humbled because there's no way that we could do it ourselves. And so, God, we thank you so much for sending us Christ to, to come and, and to mediate between us. And, uh, Lord, I ask that you continue to open our eyes and our understanding uh, to him and to his role as we continue our study in two weeks. Lord, I ask that until we, we can gather again, keep us, keep us well, keep us safe, and, of course, keep us on the path of discernment. We pray all this. In Jesus' name.